It's like a high school lunchroom in here. Um, Thank you very much. I believe in starting on time and finishing on time. My name is Nick Babulis. I'm the chair moderator of the College Executive Committee. Uh, we're technically the hosts of this event in the fall and in the spring. Um, we plan the agenda with the, with the dean and the dean's staff. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things about the College Executive Committee. Uh, this is the primary uh, shared governance uh, body at the college level. We're your representatives in advising and speaking with the dean. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns or issues uh, that you would like us to take up with the dean, uh, send them to your departmental representative or send them to me, and I promise you we'll discuss them with the dean. Uh, the CEC can also initiate new reforms or proposals as well. So um, if you have ideas or thoughts of things that we should be doing, could be doing differently or could be doing better, again, forward them to the CEC and we will we'll discuss them with the dean. Uh, I have more to say later in the meeting, so I'm going to be very brief. I'm here to introduce the Dean, Cristal Amuza, who will be speaking for several minutes, responding to the questions that you sent in to her. Uh, I think she said she got a lot of them. Um, so they're going to cluster around certain topics or themes that, that several questions related to. Uh, then you'll be hearing from the department heads, the associate deans, then you'll hear from me again. So I'd like to introduce the Dean. Save that for the end. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, before we get started, I certainly want to take a minute to uh, share my appreciation for all of you for wearing a tough spot in the semester. I think the work has really picked up. Um, so thank you for all you do. And thanks for making time out of your busy schedules to uh, be here today. Um, so our meetings, uh, we only have a two of them throughout the year, fall and a spring meeting, and they're an opportunity really to share some of our successes since the last time we've met, as well as discuss some of the challenges and opportunities down the road. Um, it would also be a great opportunity and really one of the um, uh, most important and pleasurable tasks to introduce our new faculty um, to the college. So um, I'll spend just, I think I have about 15 minutes, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I'm gonna try and be expeditious here. Um, actually, let me, Matt, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, <laughs> so um, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, giving a few updates since the last time we've met. And then as Nick was saying, I do want to go over the questions that you have submitted. So I think I received um, more than a dozen questions clustered on different areas. Um, and if there's something that um, I run out of time, you know, I'm happy to follow up with via email. So um, when, um, when, when I gave a talk last fall and even during my interview, I kind of clustered my priorities around those four areas, enrollments, our intellectual and physical capital, excellence and innovation, and building more community, both within our departments and our college. So um, again, very briefly, I just want to give you some quick updates. And Sarah McCarthy, I think she's here and she'll talk a little bit more about enrollments. Uh, but um, we're doing pretty well in our undergraduate space. Um, so we have uh, 700. 128 students. Uh, we actually exceeded our targets for our first year students, which is wonderful. Uh, that require a lot of effort from all of us um, and a lot of communication with the um, admissions committee, with the central admissions committee as well. Um, and our new programs, CS and education and secondary math are actually doing very well. So we're very excited to see um, a pretty robust cohort of uh, first year students. Um, and also just very briefly, you'd see that we're doing very well in terms of the diversity of our first year class, which um, exceeds um, all the campus averages. So really, really uh, proud and really also grateful for all the work that happens in our undergraduate office. It's a team effort for sure. So really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, one area where we have a lot of potential to grow is the LES program. So those numbers are not looking very strong, but as you know, we have a committee in place that's um, working to revive, um, reconsider that program. Um, you'll hear a lot more about um, our graduate and online enrollments, but um, just very briefly, this gives you a sense of where we stand um, this fall with our online enrollments on campus, off campus, and our undergraduate pop population. So I continue to be very robust in the online space, and Sagita will talk a little bit more about it. 
Um, just very briefly, um, I don't see Carla here, but she'll share a little bit more. I have been in communication with, um, um, hey, <laughs> I have been in communication with all the associate deans, and those are some of the ongoing goals we're working for graduate education. Um, improving student funding is a priority for us. I know I have spoken with many of you about this. Creating more opportunities for full year assistantships, that's a priority also coming from the graduate college. So the issue is really obviously, you know, the finances around it. Um, this fall, and many of you have brought this to my attention who work with grad students, thank you. Um, with some of our students have been struggling, you know, financially given the transition, some delays in them getting paid. So one of the things that we uh, will be exploring is some opportunities for startup funds as students make the transition from where they are. Sometimes they have families to here until they get paid, they have rent to pay and all those expenses um, that have uh, really been taking a big toll on our students. So really have to figure out some creative ways, you know, to support them. Uh, meeting our undergraduate students, um, especially the needs of our underrepresented students remains a big priority, um, as well as meeting the needs of our international students. And as you might imagine, there's a big overlap too in terms of international students, um, startup funding, you know, um, we did have a number of international students who felt pretty stranded. Um, other um, ongoing goals remain the diversification of enrollment. So you've seen the graph that I shared earlier, so our master's program, I think we have an opportunity there for growth, both in terms of in-person and online. So that's an area where we need to be um, looking a little bit more creatively um, and increasing the range of graduate course offerings, which um, I've gotten a couple of questions about it. So I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Um, so... Uh, Investing in our faculty uh, remains a key priority for our college. We've got a very good um, year, you know, with nine new faculty this year. We have 10 searches underway. Um, so we're expanding, you know, but at the same time, we've got to be uh, more strategic in our hiring, making sure that our hires are aligned with the areas um, that we see potential for growth, as well as areas where we build um, signature areas of strength you know, as a college historically, and those obviously are areas where we wanna preserve. Um, we wanna maintain our leadership and faculty diversity. As you know, um, Illinois has a strong tradition as one of the pioneering um, colleges and institutions with um, attention to faculty diversity. So as we hire, you know, this is an area where, again, we've got to pay uh, increased attention, not just in terms of recruitment, but obviously retention, you know, so making sure that we create an environment where all of our faculty can thrive. Um, so we've been working to strengthen opportunities for faculty and graduate student development. As you know, we have two Dean's Fellows this year working on aspects of faculty development and mentoring, as well as a Dean's Fellow for graduate student development, who's working more closely with Carla's office to um, uh, strengthen what we offer to our graduate students without duplicating uh, what's happening in the departments and at the college and university level. So a lot of that work would actually focus on um, diving a little bit deeper into the data. Um, we have a lot of data from both the graduate college and the college and seeing some historical trends um, because those trends will be very important as we think about those other commitments that I made earlier, you know, how can we uh, guarantee more funding opportunities for our students? Can we make that four-year funding commitment? So if we look historically, how many students we've been able to fund, uh, is there an opportunity there where we can comfortably say we can commit to X number of students? So a lot of the work of the Graduate Student Development Fellow is really looking at um, those data that we have available and looking at trends, looking at our student needs more broadly and looking at, um, again, what kinds of commitments we can make uh, comfortably in the future. Um, and looking at our um, physical space, you know, again, I recognize that we have a number of uh, challenges when it comes to space. Um, again, I have gotten a couple of questions about that and I'll say a little bit more, but we do have um, a renewed uh, space committee that's working closely to come up with better policies as well in terms of how to align space. We continue to be very strong in the, um, in the research domain, as you can see, those um, this is a screenshot of our impact report that it's currently in press. Um, so our portfolio is looking very good. Um, obviously, we've got to maintain it. Uh, those are just some screenshots from our impact report. Um, 
lots of things to be proud of, you know, as many colleges of education are thinking and um, about AI and what are they going to do about it. We actually have a whole ton of teams of researchers who are actually doing the work. So really at the forefront of those efforts and again, have a lot to be proud of. Um, those are um, teams of um, colleagues uh, with, um, with um, new funding um, who they've received over the summer. So you can see all the, um, and, and many more as a matter of fact, this is just a screenshot um, and uh, the cross collaboration, you know, and interdisciplinary work that you see. Um, and also another nice thing is you can see um, both junior faculty working with more senior colleagues. Um, and that's a great way to support, you know, our junior colleagues as they pursue more independent funding opportunities down the road. Um, um, not all of our work, obviously, um, is uh, federally funded. So in addition to AI, we do very, very important work in a not number of other areas. Um, this is some of the work that our colleague, um, Asif Wilson, shared with the provost, who, by the way, I think we had a great visit with him. Um, other work that's featured from across departments. So again, you know, lots of research activity in our college, you know, that we should be proud of. Um, and, and for the last goal, building more community, we have been working uh, very hard as we emerge back from the pandemic, you know, to create more intentional opportunities for people to come together as a community. We've been organizing more social events, including our welcome back. Um, the, the deans, the fellows for faculty development have been organizing more things. We're also trying to create new traditions. Like um, we had a um, tailgate event with our alumni, for example, over the weekend that um, even the first one, you know, gather, you know, about 60 or 70 people. Um, so um, those are all things that, again, as we move into this new faith of our college, trying to create new traditions that bring together more of our expansive community of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and donors. And I remain committed to open communication. So once a month, um, you get an opportunity to voice your questions and meet with me more informally. Um, and I think that email went out. Okay, so that brings me to uh, just very briefly next steps. I won't spend time because I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I think we need to continue to engage uh, with um, interdisciplinary innovations, both within and outside the college, um, continue to grow in all those areas of strength, obviously. Um, um, and one area where, you know, I continue to uh, pay attention is um, strengthen our visibility. I think it's very important for us to, um, we do uh, we do amazing work, you know, we've got to get better, you know, at um, being at the table, you know, at all major events and having our voice heard and also showcase, you know, the important work that happens in our college. Um, I have tried to do that in my current role, but I think this is a collective um, opportunity here. You really, again, to share the important work we do. Um, and at some point, um, in the year, we might begin to think about the next strategic planning phase. The university is getting ready to reveal, to unveil the new strategic plan um, soon, I believe. And as you know, we were kind of waiting, you know, to see what this plan might look like and how we can better align, you know, the work we do with the university's uh, vision as well. So um, I will, um, how much time do I have left? I'll try to get to uh, most of the questions I have here. I have time. Okay. I have time. Um, all right. So the first question had to do with graduate student uh, recruitment and development. So um, specifically asking whether graduate student, whether funds will be available for visit day. Um, so I uh, haven't spoken with my finance people, but yes, funds will be available for uh, recruitment. Um, if you recall last year, we try to uh, have about five students per department. So I think we can stick to that fairly comfortably. Now, you know, again, last year we, we had one department that maybe had four. So we shifted those funds to another department. So I think I'm comfortable, you know, with about 20 students or so. Now, if it's 22, it's not the end of the world, you know, but just, just keep that in mind. Um, and this was very important, especially for um, our junior faculty who did not have um, opportunities or financial resources, you know, to bring students. Um, now, the caveat last year is that I would like for us to have a more coordinated visit day. 
day. Um, so I think in the past, every department did their own thing. Students came at a different time. Um, and you may have heard me talk about, or maybe the leaders have heard me talk about creating more of a um, college vision and college unity while at the same time, you know, uh, maintaining the departmental uh, processes and policies. But I think it's important when we recruit to showcase our strengths as a college. Students come to our college, even though they're working with individual faculty in their departments, but it's important to them who else is coming, who are they going to be their peers, where are they going to be working down the road. So, um, so the funding comes with the caveat that we'll try our best to have a more coordinated college-wide visit. Um, um, I will be meeting with the graduate director soon to begin the planning. Um, and again, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a big push from the graduate college to uh, put together funding package for the students. So in my conversation with the graduate directors, um, I believe we have a meeting coming up. Um, if you can think of those most meritorious students that we'd like to recruit, you know, let's think about how we can comfortably make a commitment to them, you know, for four-year funding so we don't lose them to our competitors. Um, graduate student coursework. So I've gotten a couple of questions about the availability of face-to-face -face coursework for our doctoral students. Um, and I'd say I've, I, I'm still not as versed, you know, in the curriculum, you know, to know where the, where the holes are. But um, I did want to bring it up to just say that I'm aware, you know, I've heard it now from both the faculty side and the graduate student side. So clearly there's some aspects of our curriculum that we need to um, work a little bit on. But remember that curriculum is the purview of you all. I don't create curriculum, the departments create curricula. You create the coursework. So I think it's important as you do that, you do that with an eye towards what's available in the department, what's available in the college. Let's not try to be duplicative, um, especially when it comes to research methods, for example. Are there ways in which we can strengthen the um, research methodology preparation of our students by building on the strengths of each department rather than each department offering their own version you know, of a particular course? Um, we uh, So moving forward, I think that might be something where we can put together um, either uh, a college-wide task force, you know, to look into it a little bit deeper. But um, I think um, it is important that when we're admitting students in face-to-face -face, uh, programs that they have coursework, that it's not entirely online. Um, the um, I've gotten a couple of questions or maybe one I think related to the organizational structure of the college. How am I thinking about it? Um, given a couple of the new positions that you may have seen posted. Um, so I do wanna speak a little bit to that. Um, so first of all, I think um, it's really important to make sure that we have the supports that our faculty and students have been requesting. And a lot of those supports are related to faculty development, faculty mentoring, opportunities for them to um, learn how to be successful, you know, in this, in this new space. Um, and so we've been having these roles, you know, we've been having the Dean's Fellows for Faculty Development have been doing a lot of that work. Um, we, I also did not make those decisions lightly. So I have consulted a lot of the historical documents that we had in the college. Um, there, there are committee reports that make recommendations, you know, towards um, those additional or, or changes in organizational structure. And as Nick was saying, you know, the dean consults with the CC on all matters related to the college. So last year, we've actually had extensive conversations on how to move forward in ways that really provide our college the capacity to be more responsible responsive, you know, to a lot of the faculty and student needs. Um, so you have seen, uh, you may have seen a position uh, for Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion that just posted. Um, that's an internal position. And also, let me say that all of these positions are not 100% administrative positions. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that we 
don't want to keep pulling our colleagues away from their duties. And we also want them to maintain that shared identity as colleagues and faculty and administrators. Um, and, and so all of those positions are posted at 50%. So from a financial standpoint, there's actually not change um, because we're just taking resources that were invested in those other positions and consolidating them in a way that creates more consistency. So we're better able you know, to be more responsive to our colleagues versus having like a, a rotating open door of colleagues who come in and out, you know, of those positions without continuity. So, um, so that's my rationale for those positions. Again, you know, if you have uh, further thoughts of ideas, I'm happy to hear. Um, there was a question regarding the hierarchy in our college and the role of the specialized faculty. Um, last year, if you recall, we had to make a change in the bylaws that was specific to our specialized faculty, yet they were not um, allowed to vote on that change. So um, I have brought this issue to CC this year. So this is something that we're looking into, um, the role of our specialized faculty, what the bylaws say, um, and um, uh, looking more closely into what kinds of voting privileges you know, we can we can provide. Now, um, one thing that Nick reminds me is that we're responsible for the college bylaws, okay? So um, when I say voting, it means that voting for all college matters. Each department has their own bylaws and those bylaws might vary in terms of what they allow specialized faculty to do or not. So as we're looking at the college bylaws and looking at our specialized faculty privileges, I would encourage each department to also look at your bylaws and see, are they in line? You know, are there changes that um, are warranted? Um, because we can only work at the college level with CC. Um, I'll come back to this. Um, actually, let me talk a little bit about it. So there was um, uh, one question related to uh, service obligations for our junior faculty. Um, I can't say that I was surprised by this one, right? Uh, so, um, uh, I think I think I think it's a valid concern, you know, and and thank you for pointing this out. Um, this is an area again, you know, that along with the department heads, we have been um, discussing, you know, over the last year. Um, so, you know, for those of you who have been here or in other places, you typically hear, well, you know, just say no. You know, junior faculty should say more no's, and I would say just be strategic in the no's. You know, we are at a little bit of a crossroad, you know, here at our institution institution, right? You know, so we want to make sure that the junior faculty, they have the time they need to do their work. But as we're seeing a wave of retirements from our from our more senior faculty, we have departments where they only have one or two senior colleagues. So if we believe in faculty governance and we want to have processes in place for decision making, we have to serve, there's just no alternative. So what I'm hoping though, um, and again, those are conversations I have with the department heads is that we're strategic in terms of what are we asking our junior faculty to do? How can we better align service obligations with teaching and service interests? How can we better align with um, opportunities that they will help them grow professionally, that they would help them make networks, you know, be more visible and so on and so forth. And how do we balance those with the, um, external service obligations as well, which are very important, as you know, in many fields. So, so I don't have a I don't have a solution to that um, except to say that I'm aware, and we'll be working more closely with the um, department heads again to make sure that um, those service obligations are balanced and, to the extent possible, they're actually supporting the development of our of our faculty. How much time? I'm out of time. Okay, so <laughs> I went from a lot of time to out of time. Um, all right, let me just, um, okay, so there's there's a few more questions. I think I've addressed most of them. There was issue of lab space for junior faculty. Again, you know, we have a committee that's looking into it. I continue to communicate with the provost as well as our team here. We had two meetings now with university facilities. Um, and there's definitely no magic solution. Um, 
we're still managing, but if it reaches to a point where we're out of space, we'll begin looking outside the college. So I don't want you to be too concerned. We'll figure it out. Um, but for now, we're having a committee to create better processes and processes that are more efficient. So for example, uh, how do we handle space for our emeritus faculty? You know, Can we have a shared space for them? Are there more opportunities for some shared space, even lab space? So, um, so we'll be looking at all of those things. Um, all right, I'll stop here. And um, there's a couple of more questions and I'm happy to prepare written responses and share with the faculty. Thank you. Okay, I do need to go back to Matt now. <laughs> so, oops. Um, now, um, it's my pleasure to move into the introduction of our new faculty. So I have the uh, privilege of introducing Matthew Lambert, who is the new um, uh, head in special education. Um, so Matt earned his PhD and MED in educational psychology from Texas Tech University and his bachelor's in applied behavior analysis from the University City of North Texas. Um, he spent most of this, his career at the University of Nebraska, where he held both faculty and leadership appointments. He was a graduate director for a number of years. And um, while he has always held appointments in special education, his training is actually in educational psychology uh, with an emphasis on utilizing advanced uh, quantitative and measurement methodologies to study the emotional and behavioral well-being of school-age children with disabilities. That's so a great way to bridge you know, two of our departments. Um, and prior to his doctoral studies, he worked as an applied behavior analyst with young students uh, with intellectual behavior and sensory disabilities. So welcome, Matt. We're glad you're here. And I will now turn it to the department heads. Oh, give you the clicker, yes. Clicker, yeah. All right, uh, where do I spell, where am I supposed to? Yeah, here, okay, right here, okay. There's no X, there's nothing. Um, all right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm Kyle Christensen. I'm the current head of uh, or chair of the uh, Department of Educational Psychology. Um, we have got, uh, I'm keeping this announcement short, right? So uh, we uh, are responsible for two of the current uh, faculty searches that are going on in the college, one specialized faculty and one tenure track faculty in our uh, division of counseling psychology. We had very good pools and our kind of uh, semi-finalist uh, Zoom interviews will be uh, going on over the next uh, couple of weeks. So that's one great thing. Uh, we've got some new faculty starting in uh, uh, January. Lin Chen will be in the Castle uh, Cognitive Science of Teaching and Learning uh, Division. She's currently a postdoc at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she specializes in uh, language processing and reading development. Uh, right. Um, and then we've got a couple of postdocs who are um, working on a five-year uh, kind of large-scale uh, ISBE uh, contract that I and uh, Hedda uh, in, in special ed and some folks over in LAS are running. Dylan Burton, oh, oh I'll get him in the wrong order. Sara Saiz Fajardo, uh, uh, who received her uh, PhD here at the University of Illinois from linguistics uh, last year. And Dylan Burton, uh, who received his PhD uh, this past year at uh, Michigan State University. Um, right. Okay. Uh, Carolyn Anderson, uh, retired this past year. She's enjoying her retirement in, in Champaign-Urbana and doing a lot of, uh, travel with family across the U S. Uh, and then we've got a few highlights. So, um, one of the highlights, uh, an alumnus has designated two large gifts to the department, one that will fund a doctoral student fellowship and one that will fund a named professorship in educational psychology. Uh, the uh, Invite AI Institute was officially funded by NSF and announced. Uh, it's one of only two education-based AI institutes funded by NSF uh, in the country, and it's uh, being led by Chad Lane in EdSight. Um, other large NSF-funded, oh, there we go, I had to unfold my page. Um, other NSF-funded grants uh, awarded this past year include projects also led by uh, Michelle Perry, along with Nigel Bosch. Uh, Jennifer Cromley and Sheree Event, and Luke Paquette and CNI, uh, along with Chad Lane as well. 
Um, and that's what I'm going to limit it to. There's a lot more highlights in our fall departmental newsletter, which I encourage everyone to look up and read if you, if you would like. Um, and uh, this year, I actually received an email from one of our uh, former PhD students who got the newsletter um, and wanted to congratulate us on ver our various successes. She received her PhD from our department in 1966. Um, and before entering our program in 1955, she studied under Piaget in Switzerland. So, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, she, she's 98 now and she is, uh, she, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so, so she, yeah, so, so uh, she was very happy to, to hear about us and uh, we're preparing an alumni spotlight for her in the next newsletter. So, all right. All right. Well, thank you, Dean Musa, for, for the, the, the wonderful introduction. And uh, before I get into the highlights, I just want to say, you know, it's been it's a pleasure to be here and it's been a very warm welcome from everyone here as well. So thank you for that. So we don't have any other new faculty in the department this year. Um, we are uh, undergoing a, one search that's at open rank. So uh, we have I think whittle down to um, a fair number of uh, semi-finalist kind of candidates. So we're gonna be doing our Zoom interviews really soon and bringing other candidates to, to campus soon as well. So hopefully everyone can be engaged in those, those visits when they come. So in terms of highlights here, um, we have a number of, of new grants that have been awarded to our faculty. So Michelle Schutz has got, um, uh, was awarded an Office of Special Education Programs grant with some of her colleagues at um, Vanderbilt and at Baylor. And that project's really gonna focus on uh, building a support network and support materials and services for individuals with visual impairment as they transition out of high school and into uh, the workforce or into secondary education. And then also um, Hedda Meaden, she's uh, been awarded a new IES development grant that really focuses on augmentative and alternative communication processes. And that was um, in collaboration with a colleague out of Michigan State as well. And also Hedda has um, taken on an appointment in the Carl uh, School of Medicine as well. So she has a dual appointment over there as a health innovation professor. And then um, Emily Tarkanish um, launched a really um, uh, helpful and really innovative uh, website with um, focusing on the accessibility in CU called the Experience Champagne Urbana Accessible CU, which she worked with local businesses um, to really uh, help build out a framework and a network to help identify what are accessibility issues and what are the accessibility strengths of some of the businesses in the community as well. Um, and then some of our doctoral students, uh, Rebecca Folkerts was awarded a research grant by the Association for Positive Behavior Support to support her doctoral uh, dissertation work. And then uh, Crystal Williams, another one of our doctoral students, was awarded the J. David Sexton Doctoral Student Award from the Council for Exceptional Children's Division of Early Childhood, um, which is really in recognition of the work she's done that's really impacted the uh, lives of children, young children with disabilities and their families as well. And um, from the Division of Early Childhood, um, one of our faculty members, Mickey Ostrowski, was also awarded this year's um, Mary uh, McEnvoy uh, Service to the Field Award too, which recognizes essentially her uh, contribution over her career to the field, um, which is I think the, the highest award that can be, uh, be given by the Division of Early Childhood at CEC. So quite an accomplishment. And then, yes, 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 yeah, so yes. <laughs> And then um, the last announcement is that um, uh, one of our faculty members, Megan Burke, 
uh, left the, the university this last year and took up a position at Vanderbilt University in special education there. Um, I think that that does it for my, my announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Mickey Ostrowski, faculty member in special ed, interim head in curriculum and instruction. So um, I mostly focused on the new, I did focus on the new faculty. So I'm still learning a lot about this department. So I don't know all the grants, but I know people have received many grants over the last four or five months since probably the May uh, faculty meeting. So let me tell you um, about the department, what I know. We have five searches going on. So quite a few of the ones that are currently underway. Um, so you'll see lots of announcements for job talks. And in fact, I was I was prompted to tell you that there's one tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. So should you please come? Um, so our first candidate is coming in. We have a head search going on. We have a search in uh, computer science education, a search in early childhood. It's an online search, a search in early childhood focused on literacy, and then a program coordinator position. Some are specialized, some are tenure track. Okay, as far as um, four new kind of faculty, um, Elizabeth Dyer uh, came to us from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where she was a research assistant professor. Elizabeth's work focuses on educators' professional learning in K-12 mathematics, science, and STEM contexts from a learning sciences perspective. Her research explores how teachers' everyday work can be a site for meaningful and transformative professional learning toward teaching that is responsive to students and to communities. Professor Dyer's work has included descriptive studies of professional learning in action and design-based research about embedded professional learning models. So when you see Elizabeth, please welcome her. Second person, um, new faculty member in a tenure track position is Stephanie Tolliver. She came to us from the University of Colorado Boulder, where she was an assistant professor. Stephanie's focus is on secondary English education. Informed by her love of science fiction and fantasy texts, as well as her experience as a ninth and 10th grade English teacher, Dr. Tolliver's research and teaching centers, uh, centers the freedom dreams of Black youth and honors the historical legacy that Black imaginations have had and will have on activism and social change. So when you see Stephanie, please uh, welcome her. Um, Lynn Burdick is a familiar face to, oh, she's right here. Oh, and Elizabeth is. Okay, there's Elizabeth, there's Stephanie. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see the two of you. <laughs> okay, um, Lynn Burdick is a familiar face to the College of Ed and to CNI. And while she's going to remain as the elementary ed program coordinator through the end of this semester, she also began a new position in the summer as if she doesn't have enough to do. As part of an investment for growth grant that she and Catherine Corrin Special Ed received, they're creating a master's degree concentration in trauma-informed practice and pedagogy. And Lynn will be the director of that trauma-informed education program. Okay, and finally is Todd Lash. After working in the Champaign schools for several years as the school librarian and enrichment uh, specialist at Southside Elementary School, Todd recently returned to the College of Education after he received his undergrad degree in LAS, his master's degree in CNI, and his PhD in SPET, special education. So he was hired as the director of the Computer Science Teacher Education Program, overseeing the new CS Plus Education Program and the CS Endorsement Sequence for Practicing Teachers. So that's the new people in CNI. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm Yoon Pak of Education Policy Organization and Leadership. And I really expect this to be an engaged uh, presentation because I know I'm gonna forget something and someone. So I would appreciate someone blurting things out as I forget, because you know how well prepared I am in these moments. All right. So I uh, wanted to first mention uh, recent uh, retires by Drs. Ann Haas Dyson and Cameron McCarthy really important cornerstones of what they've been teaching and uh, the generations of students that they've advised and mentored over the years. So we wish them very well. They, they were very humble in their approach to departure, but we uh, definitely uh, wanna appreciate them in very different ways. We have active searches going on at the moment to specialized faculty searches uh, in uh, instructional design, technology and organization and diversity equity, higher ed, social science ed policy, runs the gamut of the department. And we have a tenure track faculty search in learning design and leadership. 
Uh, I want to say there's one more, but I'm forgetting. Someone blur it out if I forget. All right. So uh, actually, we have uh, more. Is there another slide? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before I go into introducing our new great faculty, I also wanted to mention we do have a new staff person, uh, Gabby Zarco. She started in February, but uh, you know we haven't had an opportunity to recognize her formally in this setting. She's been an incredible, incredible asset support help. Uh, hitting the ground running and everything. So thank you, Gabby, and in also helping Laura, who we know EPO would not be EPO without Laura. Okay, so with our new faculty, wanted to mention Stacy Bennett, who is 50% with us and 50% Office of Community College Research and Leadership. Her background is in higher education, also disability uh, policy and aspects, uh, was a, an interim state senator for Illinois State, so comes with a great deal of government policy politics experience with that. Uh, we appreciate Stacy being here with us. We have Anya, who is on the way of coming from Brazil at, very soon, and a teaching assistant professor coming and teaching primarily within learning design and leadership, but also overlapping with global studies and education, in particular with uh, um, IEAL program. Why am I blanking on that title? International Education <laughs> Administration and Leadership. <laughs> But it's also because she has strengths and talents across very uh, different areas. But looking at aspects of mobile technology and learning uh, among students and teachers, we have Kimberly Ransom, who uh, is coming uh, with us through the Campus Drive postdoctoral program, and uh, primarily within a history of education, but social science ed policy, but really looking at aspects of uh, Black childhood. And what does that mean in terms of various different con uh, contexts that happen? All right. Next, yes, we have Gabriel Rodriguez, who received his PhD from us many years ago, uh, was at Iowa State, and a uh, special uh, T research area looking at uh, students of color, youth activism, and suburban settings. So a very important burgeoning area of research. We have Nicholas Tanchuk, who comes with us with an incredible amount of different forms of experiences and philosophy of education, looking at ethics, uh, some industrial experience, looking at technology, aspects of leadership in that area, uh, and uh, overlapping, but also adding important areas to forms of epistemic injustice in many uh, important ways. All right, we have Oliver Tapaha, who is one of our campus drive postdoctoral scholars, along with Jennifer Johnson, uh, looking at indigenous methodologies. What does this mean in, in particular for researchers working and uh, living and learning within indigenous communities? Uh, unfortunately, he can't be with us because of, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a death in his family recently. So, all right, let's see. In terms of uh, the grants, I really wanted to highlight the uh, the faculty from this early fall who have uh, garnered active grants. So apologies to those who maybe received a grant last week, but it wasn't in our report. But uh, and from various funding agencies like NSF, ISB, uh, Community College uh, Research Board, uh, private foundations like the Asian American Foundation. But we have folks like uh, Ade Adeyemo, Sam Lindgren, and John Hale, who also received an investment for growth uh, grant through uh, the university and working and extending on sustainability education and social justice. Rebecca Heinz Pfeiffer, Paul Bruno, Rachel Rogman. Rebecca Taylor, Lorenzo Baber, and there's the Black Teachers uh, uh, Collaborative. That's also part of that. Uh, uh, Re Rebecca Ginsburg with Education Justice Project. That's uh, an incredible Im importance and service to the university, as well as myself and Sharon Lee with the Teaching of uh, Equitable Asian American History Grant Project. All right, that's it. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, um, well, we have a, a couple of announcements to make as well. Um, well, we lost uh, Donita Harris, our um, the bureau assistant. Um, but we have um, just yesterday we welcome um, 
uh, Dr. Um, Megan Fisher is our uh, director for uh, school university relations. Um, she uh, she has um, uh, been working with the university for over 10 years and have experience in Beckman and uh, advanced science and technology, family resilience center. And he got she got her PhD from human development and family studies before joining us. She has uh, she holds a, a research assistant professorship at the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. Oh, we're really kind of excited for her, her to join us, and um, we have high uh, expectations for for her. And and so I hope like she will get support. And uh, you know when she's visiting you and having conversations with, with you, and you welcome her to our family, and then to really support on um, her work in that aspect. Uh, and, uh, in terms of um, I'm sorry, we didn't have a picture for you. Well, she's right there. <laughs> she even had the right color. <laughs> yeah, you had the right color. <laughs> That's really good. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's important. You know, I noted those things. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So in terms of, you know, kind of, a, I want to mention like research and grant development um, you know, that on purpose research and grant development. So we still, uh, you know, kind of continue support with the seed grant. We continue work with the uh, the campus research um, committee uh, to looking for uh, new ways and different ways to develop uh, the research and grant development. And uh, we're gonna have another, a couple of mixers uh, going to take place. And that's another way uh, we support, uh, you know, kind of research and grant development in the process. Uh, one is in November with the business school, and then there were another one with cancer center is coming up. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, we continue with um, our individual conversations with faculties and particular new faculty are probably going to hear from us. We're going to continue those conversations. And, uh, you know, obviously you can always reach us to have those com conversations in terms of grant submission. And uh, we constantly hear a really I mean, positive uh, feedbacks about our uh, pre-award team. And they're very, um, so, you know, uh, I, all the good things I hear constantly is really good. And they help uh, everyone develop their um, uh, budget and budget narratives. And then if you need a checklist, they often are very good with kind of help with those checklists. Um, so I haven't heard anything bad so far. So I'm really, really pleased with our uh, grant uh, uh, support team. And uh, <clears throat> and as you know, we're short of staff. and and we have to say like Bass is doing the, you know, the grant uh, development stages and trying to come up with support large grant efforts and also um, trying to provide reviews in the in the process. You know, I'm uh, I'm not also 0% administrative assist, you know, kind of uh, administrative position. Um, I still have like roughly 25 uh, PhD uh, students I have to advise. And so there's just kind of a, so reviews, we're really trying to provide the review support, but the limited uh, capacity we have, we're really kind of investigating additional ways we can provide that type of support. And um, I have been trying to uh, reach out to different um, um, resources and try to investigate in some of the possibilities we can um, help with review, you know, grant reviews. I think that's that's one of the things we're really kind of looking for what we can do in terms of this come upcoming year. And then maybe something happened in the summer. So we're trying to looking for different ways to do that. And one of the things is submission numbers in my mind, you know, kind of, we increase submission numbers. So when I see the submission number drop, I was like, like my heart will, ah. <laughs> And then we, we're really happy to see the submission numbers increase, but also the heat rate is another thing I'm really kind of looking for to, to improve on that. I think one of the ways to do that is to have provide really useful reviews, you know, kind of to be able to do that. So that's one of the efforts where uh, S Bureau and the research um, office were really working on trying to kind of trying to do that. In terms of communication, uh, we're still um, sending out like our newsletters, you know, even though we do have shortest shorthand handed right now. Um, uh, but we kind of uh, try to really keep that up. We uh, update our website, you know, periodically. So if you need some information, we want to make sure you have the right information and current information on our, on our website. And, um, and uh, another thing is we continue trying to like make connection with the, uh, the campus 
and even outside of the campus, like research communities, you know, trying to learn what they're doing, how they're doing, how we can involve them. So we continue to do, to do that. You know, we, we involve with in uh, the research community uh, within the campus, even the, the national research community. And we also involved with like IIN, the uh, Illinois uh, Innovative Network. We continue involved with the, uh, uh, the uh, Discovery Partner Institute. And we continue, uh, I'm just recently, I started sitting on the general uh, AI expert uh, expertise community committee or something, I don't know what to call it. So there, we're just starting. So we're kind of trying to, uh, I, I guess I'm actually the only faculty member or mostly I'm from IT and and uh, uh, CITL. And so I guess I was there providing my, because of my uh, kind of education uh, area. So we're trying to uh, influence and how, um, how the AI like in kind of tools will be introduced uh, as part of our faculty or fac or staff uh, uh, daily work compository or how AI may be incorporated into the HR practices or organizational practices or most importantly and uh, teaching and learning. One of the things I want to I want like I bring to the community is because I believe the the university has to be a center of expertise for the our communities. So Wobi has to kind of share information to the K-12 uh, schools and how they, you know, when they're seeking AI uh, tools and to incorporate in their classrooms and how they educate their students, is all that need to be part of the, like our efforts. So those are, um, yeah, so we keep, uh, I, you know, I'm also in conversations with our other Big Ten ADRs and uh, even beyond that. So kind of just trying to understand what other universities are doing that. I can bring it over and then you know help us to do a better job and, and so forth. So kind of a lot of different communities uh, are learn, you know, also uh, really kind of I'm really I'm reading, I can't believe I'm reading congressional AI reports, you know, kind of all that, <laughs> just trying to get my, my hands on those informations. So it's kind of an interesting uh, journey for us. So um I guess did I miss anything? I'm looking at my uh my people there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I'm excited to tell you about a few highlights of our undergraduate programs. Uh, so the Dean kind of gave some overall numbers here. We've broken down a bit in terms of we've got 728 undergraduate students, 170 first year students and 44 transfer students. So we're continuing to increase our transfer numbers. All right, so I think people are interested in kind of how this breaks down and we have mentioned a bit our computer science plus education program, as well as our secondary education mathematics programs. So you can see that elementary education continues to be our largest program, uh, but we are definitely growing in terms of our other programs as well. So we, we'd like to see that growth. Uh, and I also want to point out just kind of the, the subtle changes from our uh, 22 to 23. Notice how many more applicants we got uh, for this fall. And here's where we ended up in terms of our actual fall registration. So in terms of next year or people who are going to enter in fall of 2024, we've set our target with just a few more students. Uh, I think we can handle them throughout our programs, and we'd especially love to see growth in our learning education studies program. So for the first time ever, the College of Education participated in Illini Fest. So it was two Saturdays ago, and it was really a tremendous event. Our staff was on hand to talk about our programs. So we had 50 students in attendance. We had tours, presentations, and uh, it was just really interesting for me to interact with prospective students and parents and field the kinds of questions that they have, which are wide ranging. 
uh, but I enjoyed that. There's especially lots of interest in secondary education, math, and special education. So we were happy to see that. And we're already getting some feedback from parents who said it was such a great opportunity, the tour and the overviews. And I want to point out that we have these tremendous education leaders. You've probably seen them uh, in the Zola Coffee Bar, uh, but they have been running a number of events for our undergraduates across the college. So they've got face painting going on. They've had a number of professional kinds of events as well as these social events. And it's really made a difference in terms of bringing our students together as a community. So I think it, we're off to a great start this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Hi. I don't have a ton of numbers for you, but if you want full enrollment numbers when I'm done, I can give you those. Um, great news, uh, Linda Simpson in our office received her, is this working? Received her 15-year uh, uh, work at U of I uh, this uh, fall, and we were excited about that. We had a little party for her, and some people in our hall came down and celebrated with cake and coffee and tea. Lori received her 10 years of service. But that's not all that she's done for us. She's been here 11 years now as of October, and she has 17 years of service total with all that she's done across campus and other places. So please congratulate both of them on their long-term service. So Morgan is also with us and settled in. So she's headed to her first year and we're really excited to have her. So um, I think our team is working really well. Um, they would like to give congratulations to all of them as being a cohesive group that really supports our students. We've had a couple struggles in the spring and the fall with things going on with fellowships up campus and different issues going on. And the, the office has just really pulled together. All the staff work really well together and jump in for each other. And I feel like we've handled everything very well going forward. The TA orientation was a great success. Thanks also to the staff in the office and everybody here who participated, presenters who I'm seeing here, people who volunteered, people who helped organize. Just a big thank you to everyone. And we will be reaching out again next year for that. We've got a lot of great feedback from the TAs coming in and saying how helpful it was and how much they enjoyed meeting each other and working across departments. A couple things we started new this year. So last year we started a first gen group, which was successful. We had a social one semester and we had a panel the other semester. Um, this year we flipped it. We did the social this fall and we'll be doing the panel in the spring. And now we've added to that a new first gen listserv. So any students, uh, masters and doctorate who are first gen students who want to get together in the listserv, we've sent out emails to them and getting them to sign up. So if you have students who you'd like to have join that and they don't really know about it yet, the word hasn't gotten to them, uh, we will keep advertising but please send their name to Lori and me and we'll reach out and see if they'd like to be on the list serve and be invited to the events. We also have started a new graduate student events calendar. Um, this was initiated by the students asking, saying that a lot of things are overlapping. They're not sure if something's for them or not for them. Let's say CNI advertises something, can a SPED student join it? Emma Mercier just had a wonderful event that we participated in from Office of Graduate Programs talking about milestones and letting students ask questions. It was really well attended. Students stayed 15, 20 minutes after still asking questions. Um, we're highly motivated. And at first, some students weren't sure, can we come too? Um, so it was open to everybody. And, and so we want to be sure we put things on the calendar. So if you have events coming up and you want us to get them on the calendar, Lori's your best person to send those to. Um, and she'll be sure to try to get those up there for the students. We're in the full swing for planning for the 15th annual College of Education Graduate Student Conference. We're excited, number 15, so we're doing something special. Uh, this year, uh, the first year that Lori and I did it together was the first fully hybrid conference. The second year was our biggest conference, and we brought back the printed program, which was a hit. Um, and this third year, the thing that's happening is we're expanding it. The students are working very hard and have chosen to work with Siebel Center and with, um, oh, where does J-Man work now? Everybody, somebody remind me. A AEP um, and uh, working, the student co-chairs are working very hard with that. Lori's working very hard with that. And it will start now on a Thursday evening. We're going to have a 
uh, competition for the poster sessions, uh, partially funded funded by Siebel Center. They're joining with some funding. Um, and then we're going to have the full conference the next day. Uh, we're hoping to have also a pretty fancy reception after the poster session to start it uh, being a two-day conference. And at least this time, it'll be kind of a one-and-a-half-day conference. So we're pretty excited about that. It's going to be uh, February 29th for the poster sessions and the reception and March 1st for the actual conference next year. So go ahead and mark your date and please, 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 when we reach out for volunteers, volunteer. Revisions to processes we were asked to talk about. So the, as you know, the graduate student admissions process has been undergoing revision this semester because of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, the revised process is in place. We've been talking to a lot of constituents about this. We have PowerPoints about it. If you have questions, please ask us. Um, but it will be ready. It is ready for the fall application deadline. In addition, we're also reviewing, and the staff in the office has already done it, and I'm going through them. We're review reviewing admissions letters, so offers of recommendation for admission, just to give you some feedback um, to be sure that we feel like the language um, is in line. So all of you will be getting some feedback on those admissions letters, not telling you what to say or what to do, but giving some recommendations based on things we're hearing up campus and some things that might make for some more clarity. Um, Let's see what else. Um, the qualifying exam process is going to be revised, moving to a semi-automated online process. EPOL online students have already been using this. EPOL on-campus students, I think, are piloting it this semester. I don't, Alinda's not here today, but I believe that's true, right, Tina? Um, and then we're going to be moving in the springtime for all of it to be that way. So the students will be getting their exams not from Mitzi or Linda or Gina. They will be getting their questions through the online system. They will submit them there. The reviews will go through there and everything. So it'll be a lot easier to track. It'll be a lot easier to get everyone gentle reminders to be sure to get those evaluations in on time. Um, and so those reminders will come out in an automated fashion. If you have questions about that process, we will be holding you know, information sessions. But again, don't hesitate to ask. Let's see. Oh, the graduate handbook. Um, our goal is to move it from that lengthy, sometimes hard to navigate web page format to a PDF, a downloadable PDF, similar to the way that it is in the grad college. Um, and that's, I, we're hoping that that's going to start in the beginning of spring semester, that students will be able to go and download a PDF of the handbook. It'll be easier for us to revise, I think easier for everyone to navigate, and then students can keep a copy of the handbook in the year that they entered a lot more easy, a lot easier than they can now. Uh, see, I don't want to forget things, so we wrote these down. Uh, the graduate student annual review process is continuing as before. Remember, last year it went back to being mandatory that students had to complete it in order to be able to register for the next semester. That will stay in place because it is required. Um, so please do. We'll send out lots of reminders. We'll hold you know workshops for students who have confusion about how to do it. And last year we revised it so that it was better and more focused for master's students and didn't ask them a lot of questions they didn't need to answer. So we're going to keep that same process this year. If you do have any feedback on last year's process that you haven't sent to us, be sure you get that to us ASAP um, because we can tweak something still if, if something really didn't work. But otherwise, it's going to go the same as last year. We're holding, uh, I think this semester we're having five workshops. Our first gen social was held. Um, and uh, a lot of work, the staff put a lot of work into that, and the students who attended really appreciated it. The themis, thesis format check was really popular, um, and we will be holding that again. Had a huge turnout. Um, tomorrow evening, I'm holding the first uh, pre-image of research information session to encourage more of our students to engage with image of research. So I'm holding a volunteer session 7 to 8 p.m. tomorrow night online um, just to talk to students about it and encourage more of our students to attend. And we'll be doing follow-up workshops with any students who want to attend that, um, who want to submit to that. So if you don't know about it, check it out. It's the image of research competition for the grad college. There are prize money. Um, so encourage uh, your advisees if they want to come to the 7 and 8 o'clock Zoom. We'll be sending the link out again today. Or maybe, Lori, did you do that already? Already did. Thank you, Lori. Um, we have a conference proposal writing workshop coming up um, that Lori and I and the graduate conference, some of the graduate uh, student conference members will hold. Um, it'll be offered twice, 11 o'clock at noon on Thursday, November 2nd, and also 7 to 8 in the evening online, again, to help students think about writing conference proposals, both for the uh, upcoming student conference, but also just generally they can come for that too. And then we're going to have an accessibility workshop on the 7th. We have... Uh, we had the a recruitment fair, also very popular. Uh, Mitzi and Linda took care of that for GSSO. 
Um, it was the 2023 Illinois Graduate and Professional School Fair on the 18th in the Illini Union. So lots of thanks to them for spending that whole day over there and doing that important work. Um, there were over a thousand students, upperclassmen who attended the event, and there was a lot of expressed interest in our programs. So again, give them a shout out for doing that, that heavy lifting for that. Uh, Graduate Student Appreciation Week is coming up 9 to 13th. Oh, wait, well, no, we had Graduate Student Appreciation Week. Finish Strong is coming up. We kind of do similar things for both, so my mind gets twisted. So Graduate Student Appreciation Week, we had Kirby, we had a character artist who was super popular. We're definitely having him come back. A lot of students came by. There was so much laughter in the South Lobby. Um, we really appreciated that. Um, and uh, faculty and staff wrote some supportive notes to grad students on mini posters we had. The mini posters are still there. and They're not full. Could you come by and write a nice note if you haven't yet, please, on those posters for our grad students so that they're nice and full for them so we can set those up. Um, and then Finish Strong is coming up uh, December 7th through 12th, the last week of the semester. We'll have all three therapy dogs there for that um, and some other fun. And I want to give a shout out to one of the handlers for our therapy dogs, um, Tara Herless. I don't know if any of you saw in the paper, but she and her partner saved a life on Saturday at the football game. Um, and I feel like that deserves an uh, announcement. And uh, we're going to be putting together uh, something for her that maybe people could come by and sign um, because she comes by with the therapy dogs for our students all the time is a really just a big supporter of the College of Education and, and she and her partner literally saved a life. So I figured that's something to say. Um, yeah, we're gearing up for US News. That's the not fun part. Um, and we're really excited about the potential for an expanded grad student visit day um, and are working closely with the dean's office. Um, we've got some dates, you know, that we're thinking about, but we won't announce that yet because we're trying to get things coordinated in the best way possible. And um, you look into reserving hotel rooms and things like that so that we can have uh, students together and have it be a coordinated whole college event would be really excited. So anyway, thanks for the opportunity to be in this role. And who's next? Uh, so this is the report of the College Executive Committee. Uh, I have two items to discuss with you. One is a CEC item and one is not. Um, so the Dean has already introduced this. Uh, this is still early in the year, but the main thing that CEC has worked on this year is revisions to the college bylaws, uh, specifically around the area of governance role of non-tenure system or specialized faculty. Um, uh, we thought we'd have it ready for today. It's not ready for today, but we, this will be on the agenda for the spring for the for the spring faculty meeting. Um, if you know anything about the university statutes, if you haven't read them, you should read them. There's lots in there that you'd be surprised by. There's sort of two principles in the statutes for the for 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 this issue of governance roles. The first is that tenure system faculty have to vote to grant governance roles to other people. Um, some people don't like that. That's in the statutes. That's the way the statutes are, are written. Uh, and the other is now once governance roles have been voted, then everybody who has a governance role gets to vote. But you have to start the process and the process starts with the tenure system faculty voting to include other people in a governance role. In this case, non-tenure system faculty. The other, the other principle in the statutes that's relevant here is every unit decides this for themselves. So as the Dean said, this is the college executive committee deciding about governance participation and roles at the college level for college level votes or decisions. Um, and uh, it's a separate issue for each department. Uh, and there's no assumption that each department necessarily would decide these in the same way. If you look across the campus, departments across a huge spectrum of governance roles, including some where tenure system faculty say, we're the only ones with a governance role. Um, so it isn't automatic. And even within the same college, different departments can decide this in different ways. So um, this is the college executive committee decision. Uh, we certainly encourage every department to look at this issue and to look at your own bylaws to see um, uh, if, if you want to make also want to make changes in this area. I know some departments already have. Are there any questions about are there any questions about that? 
Okay. The other issue is not a CEC issue, but I asked the CEC to report to you on this, and they agreed to let me talk about it. Uh, it's, it's very important, and so I want to spend a couple of minutes on this. So earlier this semester, the dean sent out uh, a document to everybody in the college called something like uh, Guidelines on Dealing with the FOIA Law in the State. Freedom of Information Law is a federal law. It's also a state-level law. Um, and I serve on the University Senate's conference. This is the committee that has representatives from all three of the University Senates that advises the president and the board of trustees. So USC, not the university, but University Senate's conference. Uh, we heard about a case where on this campus, where in a particular department, six faculty were issued a FOIA demand to turn over all communications among those six people on any topic whatsoever over a two year period. So just stop, just stop and think about that. Um, uh, it was issued by a disgruntled colleague in the department who was clearly fishing for harmful or embarrassing or damaging information that this would pop up. Uh, USC was very concerned about this. And so we said, people need clearer guidelines about what the FOIA laws are, how to follow them, they, they're state laws, you have to follow them, but how to also work within them in a way that can protect your privacy uh, and can also avoid you from being hassled or harassed in the way that the FOIA law does allow people to be hassled or harassed. Any, If you look at the statistics, the number of FOIA requests on this university goes up every single year. Uh, anybody can issue a FOIA request for any reason or no reason at all on any individual or groups of individuals in the university. You don't need to give a reason. You can even do it anonymously. Um, most of you have never received a FOIA request. I've received more than one. Uh, and uh, so the USC thought we need to develop clearer guidelines for people so that they understand how the law works and how to protect themselves. Um, and so my overarching message is look at this got these guidelines that the dean sent out it's a short document i helped to write most of it that wouldn't surprise most of you uh but you really should become familiar with this the particular reason why we're concerned about this right now is so if you're issued a foia request once you're issued the foia request you can't delete things you can't say, oh, well, what? I, I can't send this forward. I, this, I never intended anybody to ever see this. You get a FOIA request, you have to turn over everything to the universe system level FOIA office. They decide what gets released and what doesn't get released. There's certain exemptions. There's certain things that they review. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. It, it, I thought somebody was reacting. Um, They decide. They're reviewing thousands and thousands of pages of material. I can tell you stuff gets through. Um, and it is, I can tell you from personal experience, very upsetting to see something on the front page of the newspaper or spread all over social media that you wrote from person A to person B that you never intended anybody to see except the person you're sending it to. So the time to deal with FOIA isn't when you get the FOIA request, because by then you have to turn over everything. It's to practice what we call good FOIA hygiene before you get the request. Uh, yes, um, and uh, protect yourself. Finally, the main reason that we were concerned about this is I think everyone understands the context of higher education today. We have a lot of people out there who are not our friends. And I think people have not yet figured out how to weaponize, how they can weaponize the FOIA laws to harass people to make their lives miserable. You can, the same person can send multiple requests. It's a huge time sink to respond to these, especially if you're getting every communication or every email over a two year period. I mean, just think about having to recover all that material. Um, and finally, that particular groups, particular individuals, particular uh, identity groups or ethnic groups or racial groups or gender groups, people with certain political orientations are much more likely to be targeted by people who are weaponizing FOIA in a way that's looking for something to embarrass them, to embarrass the institution, to embarrass their group or their unit. 
Uh, and so we felt, I mean, our hair was on fire when we wrote this report. The final report's much calmer than the original one, but we really felt that this is something that every faculty member, every staff member really needs to understand, become familiar with these rules, and don't wait till you get a FOIA request, because by then, again, the requirement is to turn over everything that's requested. You don't get to filter or choose or select. Um, after you get the FOIA request. So the time to do FOIA hygiene is before you get the request. And I'll pause again. I'm happy to answer questions about that. Yes. Yeah, great, great question. So first of all, that only pertains to university emails, not other email texts. FOIA is any electronic communication in any form sent from any device. Um, so text from your phone, emails, it's not only university emails. You're correct that people can go directly to the server and find all of your emails. The FOIA office's current practice is the request goes to you and you turn over everything that you have. Um, if you don't have it, you can't turn it over. But they, some people, I've heard some people say, go directly to the server. I don't even want to have to deal with it. Uh, but in that case, then they get everything. And then somebody else decides whether it's responsive to the FOIA request or not. Yes, I will. So the question was, um, uh, just because you delete something on your laptop, it still exists on the university server. It That does apply to university email. doesn't reply to text or other kinds of things. So FOIA is any document, voicemails, um, even written documents, handwritten documents in some cases are FOIAble. So anything that creates a record of a comment, of notes, um, again, some of those things are supposed to be exempted uh, and the FOIA people at the system level are very conscientious, but things do get through. Um, of these six people, for example, that were FOIA'd, two of them are spouses. So imagine all the communications between them on about their kids or about date night or whatever, you know, that they're never expected anybody. Again, you would say, well, that, sh that should be exempted. That shouldn't be released. I know of cases where information like that was released. So there's privacy considerations as well. Allison. I, I'm sure it's coming. And by the way, you mentioned something else. It's not just faculty, any university employee. So this also pertains to staff as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised if people get those individual FOIAs, they should come to our offices because we generally send them all together. Yep. State law says course syllabi are exempt from FOIA. Yep. Yes. Syllabi are supposed to be exempt. Syllabi are the professor's intellectual property, not subject to FOIA. But this shows that somebody somewhere is interpreting the law and what they think is and isn't foiable. And I can tell you, having worked in the default is almost all, always release more rather than less. No one ever takes you to court for releasing less, uh, for, for, for releasing more than you're required to release. Uh, I just said why. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Restate the question. So. Right. 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 Yes, so Sarah, Sarah asked about the FOIA, FOIA syllabi, uh, which are supposed to be exempt by the FOIA law, but the university is saying you have to turn them over. Uh, are there accreditation reasons why? I don't know why they would do that. But as I said, when you deal with 
you, when you do, I, I deal a lot with university council. They are really great people, but they're also very risk averse. They're very lawsuit averse. And so when a request comes, they will always default on the side of releasing more than they have to, rather than being accused of releasing less than they have to. Um, and again, having been through this process myself, there was stuff released that I wrote. I shouldn't have written it, my fault, but uh, it absolutely was, it should have been exempted. Um, and uh, so you don't get to decide what should and should not be released. That's done at the system level, and it's done by people who are, as I said, lawsuit averse and risk averse and, and bad press averse. Yeah. Right. So the criterion of the FOIA, uh, the, the criterion of the FOIA law is material related to the transaction of university business. That's the key phrase. So, um, only because it could be released accidentally at that level. Um, you have to turn it in and the FOIA staff. Right. 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 There are both. Um, and also it turns out, I mean, we all do email. I mean, every email contains sequence of all the emails that came before it. Uh, and so the, the top level email may be something completely harmless, but four emails before you said, you know, you called a colleague, one of your colleagues, a jerk or whatever. You don't go back and reread the entire um, thread. Not that anybody would well, ever say that about any colleague. Um, um, but, you know, a, a, a good general rule is don't put anything in an email or a text message that you're not prepared to see on the front page of the newspaper or in social media. A really good habit is you want to talk? Give me a call. Let's go get coffee. Don't use email to have a deliberative discussion or snarky back and forth or whatever, because that's exactly the kind of stuff that people find very juicy. This is going on longer than my time. Um, so please, please read the guidelines. Uh, they're pretty clear. They're not that long. Personally, I'm happy to answer any further questions as that I, I wrote most of them. And I'm sorry, I took up more time than I was scheduled to. Thank you. Uh, I'll do it here. I'll try. So, oh, well, can't see. Okay. Um, after that hair raising topic, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about anything as hair raising as that. Um, so, I'm Sangeeta Gopala Krishnan, and I am the Assistant Dean for Online and Learning Innovation here. A quick shout out to the other staff members in my unit. Um, we have Travis Giffen, he's the assistant director. Um, Brianna Davis is the online student advisor. And Gina Puff is our online academic and student services coordinator. Um, so I wanna start by um, giving you a snapshot of what um, online enrollments look like. So Dean Musa shared this um, image earlier. So what you're seeing is actually a representation of enrollments last year. So for the entire academic year last year, we had over 2,000 enrollments in the college. And of these um, 2,334 enrollments, a thousand, over a thousand were from online um, enrollments. So that is approximately 40% of the total enrollments um, come from online, came from online enrollments last year. So the orange um, slice is, represents the online enrollments. The green um, slice and represents the undergraduate enrollments. Uh, the blue slice 
blue slice, the on-campus graduate, and the gray slice, the off-campus enrollment. You're assassin. I'm going to break the knees of people who don't think is that a voice in my head? <laughs> so those online en enrollments come from our online programs, and this is what um, our online program portfolio looks like today. So we have four, we have an online doctoral program with four concentrations, uh, an online master's program with seven areas of focus. Um, we have 19 online graduate certificates. And we also have 12 MOOCs on the Coursera platform. We added two graduate certificates last year, two new graduate certificates, and that is included in this 19. So we spent a lot of time last year on marketing and communications with respect to our online program. So working together with our um, marketing and communications team in the college, that's Gina Manola and her team, and with CITL Marketing, um, we worked on developing a brand for our uh, online programs, um, recruiting students for our online masters and uh, graduate certificate programs, um, developing marketing campaigns. We did a quite a bit. We did quite a bit of that. Developed social media ads, digital ads, search engine um, ads. Um, we reached out to our prospective students and newly admitted students, we saw that we were losing at least about 20% of admitted students who didn't choose to come to University of Illinois. So we, we realized that's a, a population that we can uh, try and woo. So we worked on um, uh, getting them to uh, come to us rather than go to any other uh, institution. And we also worked on communicating the successes of our online students, um, made a concerted effort. Um, so as part of identifying opportunities for growth, um, we were guided by some questions. So we looked at what programs and credentials do employers uh, value? Um, what credentials and programs do our students value? And then we try to really uh, match market needs with what do we have uh, in the college? What kind of expertise? faculty expertise do we have in the college and how can we support faculty um, in developing new programs? Um, so we not only looked for opportunities outside uh, campus, uh, but we also are looking at opportunities for growth inside campus. Um, for example, we're looking at um, collaborating with other colleges. I'll give you a quick example. We are in conversation with the College of Veterinary uh, Medicine um, they have a ma master's in veterinary sciences program, and some of the students in that program uh, are aspiring to be educators or are already educators, and they uh, are looking to pick up some courses in education. So it hasn't been uh, easy for this kind of um, interdisciplinary um, collaborations or for students in one college to go pick up um, courses in another college. But we're trying, or we have a pilot program now and we're going to try and facilitate um, students in, in the MBS program to pick up some courses in instructional design from our college. We're also looking at the non-traditional uh, learner environment and uh, trying to figure out what can the College of Education um, offer for non-traditional learners online. Um, Campus now has Canvas Catalog, which is a portal or a learning management system which you can use to offer uh, programs, courses to non-University of Illinois students. So non-credit programs can be offered on that portal. Um, it's really easy to pay for somebody outside the campus to pay for a course, swipe and pay, uh, swipe, uh, pay and learn sort of a model. So if you are interested in a professional, in creating a professional development program or a continuing education program or an in-service teacher education program, Please come and talk to me. I'd love to explore um, ideas with you. Um, so one of the opportunities for uh, funding and support is the Investment for Growth Grant. Uh, you know, it, it's been mentioned before by the department heads. So we already have a, a, a grant uh, that was funded for developing an, uh, an online concentration in instructional design last year. We received two uh, investment for growth grants. 
one for developing a concentration in trauma-informed uh, education, um, and then one for developing a, a graduate certificate in sustainability education. Again, if you have ideas and you want to explore options for next year with me, please feel free. Um, and our uh, another area of great focus for us last year was our online students, and we have um, we implemented several uh, ideas for. Um, enhancing the online student experience. So uh, for one of the uh, one of the efforts we took was in um, sending welcome packets. So a physical packet to our online students, you know, uh, with swag. Um, so it was an effort to make our online students feel more connected with the college and with uh, the university. And so the last piece of good news is of course we, um, got a number three ranking from U.S. News and World Report. So we have been ranked number three for the third consecutive year uh, among over uh, 300 institutions. So uh, we're due to submit. Our, yeah. And we're getting ready to submit uh, the, the survey results for the next cycle. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have the clicker? And one more. Yes, I have two quick opportunities that I want to share with everyone today um, for faculty um, to take part in if you'd like to. Um, the first is our iGlobal Laboratory. This is where we have our education students um, teaching middle school students from all over the world, um, 20 different countries, and we're adding more um, by spring. And it's an online extracurricular club for the middle school students. It's an internship for our education students. We're trying to take our education students who recently, you know, they were in high school during the pandemic, right? So many of them are coming to us with you know, almost PTSD about online learning. <laughs> so we're trying to reset that and give them a really amazing experience teaching online, being engaged um, online, and um, learning to do this in an international, multilingual, multicultural context. So it's an amazingly challenging activity for them, um, but I think we're learning a lot. For all of you, what it represents is a possible laboratory space. If you would like to do some research in this area, we'd love to have you. I'm currently looking at the global learning that's occurring for our, for our undergraduate students. So we have IRB in place to study our undergraduates in this context. It would be very easy to add additional lines of inquiry. So if you're interested at all in, in joining in this laboratory, we'd love to have you. Um, I also think... Uh, this would be a great place for you to showcase your research to teachers around the world. We host professional development opportunities for our partner teachers all over the world. Um, they come together and we share out different opportunities and research with them. Um, and they share ideas with us and ask questions um, that they want us to research. So if you have time or um, you have some um, questions yourself that you'd like to get kind of a um, sense of how the rest of the world in education is thinking about it, we would love to have you come to one of those um, professional development sessions and share um, your research or just, um, you know, get to meet these amazing teachers from all over the world. Uh, the other thing is, I want you to think of this as an exploratory space. If you just want to try something out, <laughs> it's a really fun place to do that. The, the club is just supposed to be fun for the middle school students and for our education students. It's a learning opportunity. So if you have if you have something that you want to try and you want to see how it works, um, let's play. <laughs> Come and play with us. Uh, we're having an amazing, amazing time. Um, the other thing is, if you work with middle schools anywhere in the world, locally, um, or anywhere in the world, please give them this opportunity. It's free for them. It's a wonderful opportunity for middle school students themselves to get to meet their peers all over the world um, and to use global English, which for many of them is, is a really exciting opportunity and for English teachers all over the world. So any middle schools that you work with um, and locally, I think it's important too. Think about our rural schools, you know, to get to meet for, for rural kids, to get to meet kids from all over the world is an amazing opportunity that the university can give. So if you have those connections,
questions, please let us know and we'll be happy to reach out to those schools and see if we can't um, increase our participation. It's another way to sort of deepen our partnerships, right? We already work with a lot of these schools. Let's give them another way to engage with us. So um, please keep that in mind. The other thing that I get the most questions about is study abroad. If you ever want to go anywhere in the world, please come and talk to me. <laughs> You'll have to drag a gaggle of students with you, but I promise we'll make it. <laughs> we'll make it as easy as we can for you. We'll take care of all of the arrangements. We will also, um, you know, try to set up the, the course so that you don't have to take your course time. You know, we'll just try to do everything we can to make it fun for you and um, an exciting uh you know, experience with students. Uh, for staff especially, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to get to spend time with students, not just answering their questions or dealing with their complaints, but having a great time with them. And it, it can be really um, rejuvenating and remind you of, of what we're doing here and, and why. Um, we typically have programs during winter break and spring break that we do need faculty hosts for. So if you'd like to go along on any of our programs, take a look at the, um, the schedule and just let me know. You, you, it, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we had Egypt scheduled for this year and obviously that's been canceled, but, um, but we're hopeful to get back on track and, and um, add Egypt in at a later date. So um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out and come see us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for this wonderful update. Um, so as you uh, have seen, there's a lot going on in the college, and this is just like the five-minute version of it. Um, so before we close, um, I want to acknowledge the two faculty members who received promotion this year, Mike uh, Tissenbaum from CNI, who was promoted to associate professor with tenure and Jennifer Delaney in EPAW who was promoted to full professor. Hi, right. so thanks for bearing with us. Nick tells me we're gonna skip the higher uh, ed report. So we're gonna skip over that session of the agenda. That being said, we do encourage you to actually look at that report. There were uh, important implications for our college and the CC committee came up with a few points where they thought they might be relevant for the work we do. So um, definitely make note of those. And with no further ado, please join us for the dessert reception. No meal is complete with without dessert. So we'll see you there.